Ladies and gentlemen, as we begin our tour today, again, welcome to the Rocket Garden. Hope you enjoy our Florida sunshine. We're standing here next to a rocket. This is a Juno. But our story begins in 1949. President of the White House is Harry Truman. President Truman designated Cape Canaveral as a missile testing ground. That was four years after World War II. Now, in 1949, the world was different. As Europe was divided, Germany was divided, Berlin was divided, and German scientists were divided as well. So Dr. Werner von Braun, a team, a team of German rocket scientists, came here to America, along with a large collection of captured German rocket parts. In fact, a lot of people are surprised. The first rocket launched at Cape Canaveral in 1950 was a modified German V2. Moving forward, October 4th, 1957, the first Earth orbiting satellite is launched, but we didn't launch it. That was Sputnik, launched by Russia. We were trying to get a satellite up in this country. We invited the press over to Cape Canaveral to witness the launch of our first satellite. That rocket got about four feet off the ground and exploded. The press called it Flopnik. <laughs> At the time, Dr. Warner von Braun was working on the Juno and the Jupiter C. We're standing here beside an actual Juno rocket, the type of rocket that took up America's first satellite. And our first successful satellite was Explorer 1, while Sputnik orbited the Earth with a radio transmitter. Our first satellite had a scientific package on board that detected natural occurring radiation belts around the Earth. Today, those radiation belts are known as the Van Allen belts. Now, Russia launches the first human in space, that's Yuri Gargarin. At the time, we had seven test pilots training here to be astronauts. We were looking for a rocket dependable enough to put a human on board, and we found that rocket in the Mercury Redstone. It just so happens we have a Mercury Redstone here in the rocket garden. Ladies and gentlemen, right over here you have this white rocket with the red lettering United States on it. Let's walk over and take a look at this Mercury Redstone rocket. suborbital flight. Twenty days after that, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy stood before the American public and he said, I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely back to Earth. Well, that was the 1960s. And I can tell you there's seven original astronauts, they like that part of the speech about returning safely back. They like that. Later in the summer of 61, we also launched Virgil I. Gus Grissom on a Mercury Redstone, once again a suborbital flight. We are now ready to put an astronaut in orbit. There's one slight problem. The Redstone rocket will not achieve 17,500 miles an hour, the speed necessary for orbit. So we're going to have to find a bigger rocket. 
We found it in the atlas. We have a full-size model of an atlas right over here. The shiny silver one. Ladies and gentlemen, this was an intercontinental ballistic missile. Now we're going to put a human on. Let's walk over and take a look at it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the only rocket in the rocket garden that is a full-top model. All the rest of the rocket in the rocket garden are real. Notice the shiny skin on the outside. We engineered this little rock a very long way. So this is the stainless steel that has been built so thin it's almost like aluminum foil. We engineered the weight out of the rocket realizing the lighter you make the rocket, the more the corner you can expect out of the rocket, the more payload you can put on the top of it. But we engineered so much weight out of the rocket that any time that we really want the atlas, this rocket will just collapse on itself and explode the launch pad. So to solve that engineering problem, we pressurized the rocket in opposite to keep the bridging on the launch. Now the part of the part of the rocket. This might have been the original set of masters that we've been doing. Let's see if we can get it. 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 We fixed the valve and kept the rocket pressurized February 20th, 1962. Ladies and gentlemen, John, the model. Now, Stuffed in a suit and sorted in his mouth. Three orbits later, he came back to him. And many players were including that he was just on food and she was on. He was pulled that food down most of the time. After the success of John Glenn's flight, he later won Scott Carpenter, Wally Shabbat, and Morton Cooper. Gordon Cooper was the last American to fly alone in a single seat Mercury capsule. He did 22 orbits around the Earth. Now, President Kennedy has challenged us that we're going to go to the moon. We're in a race with the Russians to go to the moon. And we realize at this point you cannot go to the moon with a crew of one astronaut. It's going to take at least three astronauts. So far, we have a spacecraft with one seat. Step by step process, we're going to build a two seat Gemini spacecraft and work up to the three seat Apollo. We have a full size model of a Gemini spacecraft over here. Let's walk over and take a look at it. Number two, we want to know, is it possible for a human to work in the vacuum of space in a pressurized suit, much like a diver in the ocean? And number three, we're our best calculations are telling us it's going to take
take about two weeks to get it back. So, I'm not sure that anybody can survive zero gravity for two weeks. So, we're going to check all of this out in low Earth orbit during Gemini. To get back to docking, in order to dock in space, you have to have a target vehicle to dock with. So, we took an Atlas rocket, we put a special nose cone on the top of it called Agena. Once we launch the Agena, that's our target vehicle. Then we launch our astronauts on the Titan. And the Gemini spacecraft had reaction control thrusters that would allow the spacecraft to actually steer on orbit. And this is when our astronauts truly become space pilots. By the way, it was American astronaut Ed White who performed the first American space walk in a pressurized suit. He was tethered, we didn't want to lose him out there. And on Gemini Titan number seven, we had two astronauts that spent two weeks in a spacecraft no bigger than this. So if you look at this, you sit in it, and you think, what would two, like, two weeks be? Be like in this. Well, remember, there's no shower and no bathroom. Now, when they landed the crew, when they recovered them at a press conference, they asked the astronauts what that experience was like. Frank Borman spoke up immediately and said it was like spending two weeks in the men's room. So you can't imagine. Two rockets in the rocket guard that never were a part of the manned space program. That's a full rainbow. That represents the Delta family of rockets we still launch today. Delta rockets are uh, used to launch satellites and space probes exploring the universe. They have a 98 The rocket with NASA written on it is a Juno 2. We never launched astronauts on a Juno 2. We did launch Pioneer before out toward the moon. That began the mapping process of the moon so we know where to land when we got there. Speaking of the moon, let's walk over here to the Apollo area. caused a spark. In a pure oxygen environment, a spark creates a flash fire that in about 30 seconds consumed the oxygen in that spacecraft. Our astronauts died of asphyxiation. After that horrible 
normal day. And to be honest with you, we were not in the mood of good astronauts back at the top of the rocket in quite a while. It took us a year to get to the top. We designed the Apollo spacecraft. Then we launched Apollo 7 from Cape Canaveral, testing that new spacecraft in Earth orbit. And it performed perfectly. Then we moved the manned space program over to the newly constructed Kennedy Space Center we launched Apollo 8 here, December 1968. Apollo 8 orbits the moon. Ladies and gentlemen, right here in the rocket garden, you'll see that we have an orange walkway over here. And this is the crew access arm that came off of 39A of Kennedy Space Center. Ladies and gentlemen, July 16, 1969, including Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins walked across that walkway. It took them to the spacecraft. July 20, 1969, the group watched on television as Neil Armstrong backed down the ladder and set his foot on the same tranquility. Between 69 and 72, we made six landings on the moon, 12 astronauts walked on the moon. Hardware. One of them is at Johnson Space Center, Houston, Texas. The other one, Huntsville, Alabama. We retain one of them here. But that's not the end of the story. We flew 135 shuttle missions here. And now we're working on the next generation of manned spacecraft here at Kennedy Space Center. And as I speak to you today, ladies and gentlemen, here at Kennedy Space Center, we, we are working on this spacecraft to follow up to the shuttle program is going to take us out of Earth orbit and we're going back to deep space exploring once again. Young people, if you want to fly with us, keep working on math, science, and computers. Math, science, and computers. Now, I'm a former history teacher, so I'm giving you this advice, math and science. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Kennedy Space Center, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Enjoy Kennedy Space Center. Got a beautiful day. Made the Florida sun shine on you all day. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.